Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are just waiting for everyone to sign in. We'll be with you folks shortly. Okay, we're going to get started. Aloha and welcome to the webinar. What is assisted living and memory care and when is the right time to move in? Presented by the Plaza Assisted Living. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Ray Waitman, Community Relations and Sales Support Director for the Plaza Assisted Living. The Plaza is Hawaii's largest senior living provider in the state of Hawaii. We have six communities on the island of Oahu, including Punch. Mililani, Moanalua, Pearl City, Waikiki, and most recently Kaneohe. We offer independent living, assisted living, memory care, and extended care programs. Before I introduce our presenter, I wanted to inform you that we will be having a question and answer session after the formal presentation. You can utilize the chat option at the bottom of your screen to ask a question. We might not be able to get to all of the questions today, but we will have our contact information on the screen and you're more than welcome to send us an email with your question and we'll answer it. We also will be recording today's presentation and we will have a link on our website no later than Monday, June 29th. I would like to introduce our presenter, David Troxel. David Troxel is a co-author of six influential books on dementia care, including the Best Friends Approach to Dementia Care with Virginia Bell. He is a past executive director of the Santa Barbara Alzheimer's Association and has been on the executive board of the American Public Health Association. He is currently a writer and a consultant in the field of long-term care and serves as a dementia care consultant to the Plaza Assisted Living in Honolulu. Thanks, David. Well, aloha, Ray. Aloha, all my best friends in Hawaii. I'm so sorry that I can't be with you in person. Uh, let's hope that better days lie ahead. And I've already told the team at the Plaza that I'll be supporting the Hawaii economy by coming there for Thanksgiving if uh, the world has gotten better by then, which we're, we're certainly sending our thoughts and prayers that it will. Uh, this is the third of a three-part series I've been doing. And I just want to, again, thank all of you. I know some of you have been on all three calls. Um, it's been really uh, fun and interesting to talk with the family members and professionals in Hawaii. I have great admiration for my best friends at the Plaza and for the Alzheimer's Association. And again, aloha and thank you for being part of this presentation. So I'll jump right in and say that today's webinar will describe some of the key factors in decision making for families considering a move into memory care. When, if, if ever, is the right time for you and your family. I'll share some ideas about how to make the move and to communicate decisions to the person living with Alzheimer's disease or other dementia. I'll describe some kind of key elements of excellent memory care. I mean, how do you choose what community uh, you will go to and what, what should you be looking for? Uh, I can also say this because as Ray mentioned, my, my mother, Dorothy, who passed away in 2009, she actually lived in an assisted living memory care community in Sacramento for three years. So I've been on really all sides of this from a professional to a family member so I have great empathy for what some of you are going through right now as you think about what your options are particularly during this COVID time. We'll discuss how staff can provide and encourage participation in activities and, and indeed what you want to look for in a staff and finally if I know some of you may be current Plaza residents um, how do you visit somebody successfully who lives in memory care what are some do's and don'ts or best practices around a visit so uh, we'll jump in. I'll have my sip of coffee. For, forgive me, it's five o'clock here in Sacramento. And I guess what I'd like to offer, having been with the Alzheimer's Association for many years, having worked with so many families, 
every family member's experience is different. Uh, some families have a lot of resources, a big family, lots of involved brothers and sisters caring for mom and dad. Um, I've talked to families where there's really very few people as part of this caregiving network. So I want to recognize right off the bat that my advice or my recommendations, you know, may really vary depending on the individual family. <clears throat> but common experiences certainly include emotional, physical, and financial stress. <clears throat> it is not easy to be a care partner, and particularly with COVID now, you know, many day centers are closed. It might be hard to get an in-home worker. Uh, this is a really tough time. I've talked to a lot of families who are struggling right now. One family recently told me that, you know, husband and wife are both working at home. They have kids who've been doing homeschooling and grandmother with dementia lives with them. It's really been a very challenging situation. And of course, we all know that even if you're doing well today, uh, this is a progressive illness and gradually the person living with dementia needs more and more care. So one early message I wanna to say to all of you and repeat it several times during the webinar is even if you think things are just going great right now for you, I always think that if there's any advantage to the fact that dementias tend to be slow and progressive, it, it does give you time to make some plans. So you know, think about your kind of post COVID care plan or just what, what things might look like in the next six months or year. Um, sometimes the healthy caregiver has a health crisis or there are other, is other issues in, in play. You don't want to have to make decisions in an emergency if you, if you can help it. So make a good plan going ahead. So <clears throat> when I think about, again, planning ahead, uh, I always like to share a few um, just general ideas because I'm always surprised with bullet number one here. I've actually talked to attorneys who admit to me they don't have a power of attorney for health care or a power of attorney for finances or even a good estate plan. But certainly as a care partner, it's very important to get your legal affairs in order. Uh, maybe it's your husband, wife, or partner who has dementia. Uh, you want to make sure that, you know, if, if they are still capable, that they've actually given you their powers of attorney as even a married couple. Uh, but certainly between parent and child, we can talk more about this in the QA, some techniques for getting these documents done if by chance your parents are not willing to do it or not wanting to do it. But this is really important. If you don't have <clears throat> that power of attorney for health care or finances, it can be really problematic. <clears throat> Forgive my craggly voice this time of day here in California. We've had a lot of allergies. Okay, <clears throat> so get your legal affairs in order. Learn all you can about dementia, particularly now that we're all kind of hunkered down uh, right now with COVID. This is a great time to take an online webinar like this, to go to the Alzheimer's Association for their online virtual support groups, to read a good book. This is a good time to learn all you can because knowledge is power. There is a right way and a wrong way to deliver good dementia care, and hopefully all of you have been part of this series, um, sponsored by my friends at the Plaza, already understand that there are a lot of good things happening. I want to introduce you to this idea of a continuum of care from, from really in-home to day centers to assisted living. There are a lot of services out there, and I think Hawaii, particularly Oahu, is pretty rich in services with a strong Alzheimer's Association presence. But if you're just starting out, for example, you want to be aware of what's out there because a lot of families will use a day center once or twice a week that maybe use some in-home care during this time and eventually of course many families do choose assisted living or residential care to help them during this journey and of course don't wait and wait and wait to use services one thing we've talked about during this whole series is that socialization is so important um, I talked to a very wealthy family a few months ago in New York City, again, before all of this uh, current uh, situation hit. And they had, you know, had a, bought an apartment for mom and dad in Manhattan, if you can imagine, and uh, had 24 hours worth of care. But, you know, they were still struggling because they would say that, hey, mom and dad would maybe watch TV all day with one of the caregivers. So if you do have an in-home worker, you want to hire someone who's lively, but recognize that by using services like a social day center, the in-home help or assisted living, you are, you know, what, what's so good for fighting depression and isolation is, is getting that socialization going. And again, uh, consider your options for residential care going forward. <clears throat> so let me jump in again and talk about, you know, what are some of the issues or challenges of being an in-home caregiver? And certainly one of them is that you have some sometimes daunting healthcare challenges if you are the primary caregiver for the person. Uh, medication management can be tough. Again, particularly if this person with dementia, the focus of this slide, sorry, I didn't set it up very well. The focus of this slide is what if your mother lives by herself? 
What if your father lives by it yourself? I just talked to a family uh, just today from Southern California. Mom is living by herself. She's in her 90s. She has dementia. She's holding on, holding on, holding on, barely holding on. And of course, all of these issues came up. How can we get mom out of the house? Because right now she's not taking her meds correctly. Someone living by themselves, maybe taking you know, too many, not enough, periodically, maybe taking you know, inappropriate over-the-counter meds, but medication management is hard. Personal care, hygiene can suffer. Maybe even a very proud, uh, well-dressed woman is now kind of driving around town or walking around town in a disheveled state. And of course, other kinds of healthcare issues urinary tract infections, dental care, all can suffer if someone's living by themselves and doesn't have a good care team around them. By the way, I don't have the statistic handy, but there are quite a few people with Alzheimer's and other dementia who do live alone, and sometimes they're very hard to reach. There are people without any family, so it is a concern that I know the Alzheimer's Association has been aware of as well. What else are some of the challenges if mom and dad are living by themselves? You may want so hard to respect their dignity and their independence, but nutrition becomes an issue, hydration, you know, drinking water, staying hydrated, uh, weight loss, all of these things can be a concern. And of course, the lack of movement, exercise increases the fall risk. In general, I'll just put it out there because I talk to families about this all the time. It's not a good idea for someone to live by themselves if they have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, all sorts of problems can come up. Now, again, you have to pick your battles, you've got to work on timing, there's lots of things we'll talk about in this seminar, but uh, make it, you know, to me, a good policy statement or philosophy is you need to get some help in there for mom and dad. It's usually not sustainable over a period of time for them to be by themselves. Now, broadening the conversation a little bit, again, what are some things that are important? The emotional social challenges, again, with this person with dementia living alone. Uh, the lack of socialization and activity. And I want to stress in the second bullet there that isolation, loneliness, and depression are known enemies of the brain. There's actually research dating back to the 1950s that people with long histories of untreated clinical depression are at greater risk for cognitive disease. And so, again, if someone is living by themselves and not stimulating, stimulated, it actually can make their dementia symptoms worse. Um, we don't think that's a good idea. We don't want the person to be socially isolated. Safety challenges, again, one more slide about someone living alone. Uh, I think that it's not really talked about enough, even though there's been great interest about the issue of uh, financial abuse and fraud. In general, we know that people with dementia, if they're still trying to handle their finances, they may pay the same bill twice or three times. Uh, we've had some rather notorious cases in, in the mainland where someone's gone and bought three new cars and the dealers have been prosecuted for elder abuse and financial abuse. But money management becomes a big concern. And, and sometimes people living alone become just sitting ducks for these you know, fake Canadian lotteries or even lending money, sadly, to a family member that they shouldn't be lending money to or some unscrupulous neighbor. So be aware of money management. I do have one tip for some of you who are caregivers and maybe even long distance caregivers. I've had people say, David, my father, he's watched every dime he's ever made. He's so careful with his money. He would never take advantage, be taken advantage of. Well, remember that when dementia strikes, judgment suffers. And so maybe your father who was a CPA and highly organized, now the checks start bouncing and, and you discover that in fact, you know, he's been a victim of fraud. So be careful of that. Uh, memory loss and poor judgment can lead to accidents, safety, safety concerns, et cetera, and of course, dangerous exit seeking someone wandering off because they, they get confused. Uh, the other day, I talked to a woman whose mother had Alzheimer's fairly early stage. She, she'd been driving, and the family, for better or for worse, decided to let her keep driving, and they had said, gee, she lives in a smaller town. She has her little route. She, she, she's, you know, no, she doesn't drive very much. Well, one day, there was a detour, you know, there was some construction going on and the mother, you know, who had kind of been coping with her little, you know, route, kind of, you know, you know, rote pattern of driving, she'd been coping pretty well, but guess what? Now there's a detour, she went the wrong way, she ended up lost and, and had gone several hundred miles, really rather shockingly, away from her home. So these are all concerns we wanna pay attention to. 
So I think we've covered, and I hope I haven't used scare tactics here, I think, but I think we've covered my concerns and general concerns about when a person lives alone. And we'll talk maybe more in Q&A, because I know some of you are in that situation, what do you do about it? Uh, but certainly we don't want that to be the case if we can help it, we wanna provide some support. So for the rest of you who might be uh, living with somebody with dementia, particularly during this COVID time, um, I, you know, I wanna just be very uh, clear in saying that you know, I've met many family members who find great comfort and reward being a caregiver. Um, I talked to someone again just in the last month or two who said, David, you know, I didn't even really have a great relationship with my mom, but you know, I'm living with her now, someone had to step up and, and we're kind of rediscovering our friendship and our connection even with her dementia. So certainly we have to understand that for a lot of people having someone at home does work. But as I said earlier, over time, the job does become tougher and, and burnout is a huge issue. Uh, again, many caregivers face exhaustion, uh, loss of our own social connections, and fear of the future. Uh, I live in Sacramento, as I said earlier, one of my neighbors a couple doors down now has his mother living at home, I think half the week and the other half in another city right near Sacramento. And he's already said to me that, you know, he, he's not doing things with his friends the way he used to. He really needs to be staying very focused on his mother. So again, this is a concern as we lose our social connections. Certainly, one thing I do recommend just on that one point is do your best to keep up with friends. Do your best to still get out there, get some respite when you can, because, you know, at some point, your caregiving situation will change. You know, your family member may pass away or go into assisted living. And, and you don't want to be left with, you know, really friends that you haven't spoken to for years or, or lack of social connection. You want to try to keep that up the best you can. I think it's very life-affirming and important. So as we think about caregiving at home, some of the challenges that, you know, you want to learn more about and things that can happen as a caregiver, and certainly things we still see in assisted living, we'll talk more about that, about how we cope with it, uh, but basically, refusal to do personal care and showers, paranoia, apathy, aggression, delusions, which a few of you have heard me define during this little three-part series, a delusion is a fixed false idea, hiding things, hoarding, rearranging household items. Now, again, some people with dementia are, are very pleasantly confused and, and maybe easy to be with, but when you really think about the world of Alzheimer's and dementia, you know, you, you are forgetful. You're not always sure what's happening. You may be convinced that you had a shower already today when you haven't had one for a week. Um, paranoia, you know, maybe someone hides their purse under the pillow and forgets it's there. You're the daughter, a very dutiful, you know, careful and ethical daughter, but your mother begins to develop a tape that you're stealing from her because she doesn't know where her purse is. You're the only other person in the house, so therefore you must have taken it. So paranoia can become a problem. Apathy. Um, I had one woman when I gave this lecture uh, say, gosh, David, if only my mother was apathetic. She's on the go all the time. I can barely keep up with her. But of course, a lot of people with Alzheimer's, they kind of lose that start button. Uh, it becomes very hard for them to do new things. And this is frustrating because as a caregiver, you want to see your family members still engaged in life. You want them to come out to the garden. You want them to take a drive for you. And it can be tough when they really, their world gets a bit closer in and they just don't want to do these things anymore. Um, I'm hoping that none of you on the call have dealt with aggression, um, but it does happen. It, it's not inevitable. It's not you know, something that happens for everybody, but there are some, some situations that can be kind of frightening. Uh, I remember talking a while back to a family member where the wife wasn't really recognizing her husband anymore. You know, who are you uh, in this house? And you know, you almost have to apply a bit of humor to this that the, the children did. But, you know, when the mother says to the father, you, you know, you need to leave, my husband may be home soon. Uh, you know, it, it, you, you just have to almost smile or cry one or the other or both. But, you know, when you think about it, if, if that wife is not sure who her husband is, you know, she could, you know, take a, 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 a vase and hit him over the head. She might think he's, she's an intruder. He's an intruder. So, so you do want to be attentive to these situations. They're not common that it, it, it rises to that level of concern or violence, but you do want to be careful with that. And again, these delusions, you know, uh, you owe me a thousand dollars, you never paid me back, 
things like that can be tr a trouble. And of course, the last bullet, again, we may be continually retrieving things, et cetera, but that can certainly add to some frustration. So dementia-related behavior can be a challenge. I will share with you that uh, there are a lot of good resources on the web about that, some of the workshops I've done, which will be available through the plaza. We can figure out some strategies, but, but it, is, it can be a tough road when you are caring for somebody with dementia at home. And we'll have some time for Q&A if you want to talk a bit more about it. And, and you know, I, I have to say that sometimes the best caregivers become the bad guy. And I'll never forget this one daughter in Morro Bay, California. <laughs> And she was a real sweetheart. I, I worked with the daughter. She was in my support group. And this goes back probably 20 years now. But her mother was living with her at home. In fact, I guess the daughter moved into her mother's home to care for her. And the mother just was convinced that she was, had been abducted. So the mother would, would slip notes to everybody. She, she'd write out notes and give it to the postman and give it to someone delivering milk or you know, at the grocery store. And what happened is the daughter almost became a pariah because everybody thought that the daughter was some deep villain, right? Um, so, you, you know, you, again, you have to be aware that sometimes these things do happen with dementia care. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I wrote that note in my own handwriting because I've long lost the note that she gave me, but this was the gist of the note. But I do want to be authentic with you and let you know that I did this for the purposes of illustration. But uh, it's too bad. I used to have actually about a dozen of the notes that the daughter would always bring to support group. She'd give them to me and they were quite interesting and actually rather well written as as uh, as uh, notes to the police go so as we think about this journey of being a good dementia caregiver uh, and again I hope I hope I'm kind of hitting an appropriate tone in, in sharing with you the challenges that are out there to be aware of to think about so that if these are things that are going on you can make a game plan to get some respite you know, involve other family members in help, or again, use appropriate services, look at assisted living or other options for yourself. But, you know, families are very resilient. My own father cared for my mother at home for many years before she moved into assisted living. But sadly, sometimes even the best caregivers become the bad guy, all right? I'm sure many of you will agree with this. Um, and it can be very tough. Um, but the three things that I find that are often the tipping point for a uh, placement in memory care, because I know all of you are interested in this subject, number one is lack of sleep. Uh, because I don't care how good you are, if mom is getting up at night, making a racket, if you're losing sleep, it's very hard to sustain that over a period of time, particularly if you have other responsibilities like family and work. You know, the personal care, the continence care, I never thought in my entire life I would be able to do this, but guess what? You do what you have to do. I, I changed briefs to my mom, I helped her in the shower, I did all these things that you just kind of do when you have to do them, right? When she was still at home. Uh, but at the same time, sometimes that can really be daunting and challenging. And particularly, you know, I was lucky. My mother was rather pleasantly confused and she didn't fight me. But you know, if you have somebody who won't take the shower and won't do these, it can be very, very tough. And of course, just in terms of relationships, sometimes you know we're the ones saying no, we're the ones uh, you know creating a lot of challenges and saying, "Mother, you you can't drive a car," you know, the doctor won't let you, you know, and 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 you can become the bad guy very easily. So, see, these are some things that I think really are uh, should be an alert that you need to start thinking about the future and and potentially making some plans for change because at a certain point, as a caregiver, you just can't make this all happen. On that second bullet, and I think I'll talk about this a little bit later too, you know, it is interesting to me that sometimes in assisted living or even in some of the day centers that have more full services, it, it's kind of incredible that your family member may do things for other people that they won't do for you. Uh, and sometimes staff have that detachment and professionalism and confidence to, to get that shower done, for example. A friend of mine's father is in hospice right now and they're just in awe of this one caregiver who does the bathing twice a week. Uh, and, and they struggle, struggle, struggle. And this one woman just sort of has the knack for doing that. She can really get it done. Okay. And of course, we've covered most of these, I think, already. But, you know, number one, certainly, thank goodness, is not, to me, not all that common. It can happen. Uh, the second bullet actually is fairly common because, you know, we have a home. We don't don't have a secure memory care unit with a delayed egress door and lots of alarms, and, and people can get away from you. It can be very scary. 
Uh, the Alzheimer's Association, I think, still has a medic alert, uh, safe return type of program if your family member is prone to wandering or exit seeking, but that can be scary. And that third bullet, you know, if you yourself are really beginning to feel that, that you might be depressed, this sense of hopelessness or burnout, fatigue, inability to work, estrangement within the family over care issues, I hope you'll take care of yourself. And again, you know, think about, you know, what the future might be. Um, I don't have a slide on it, but one recommendation I do have, if you're, if you're just kind of thinking about the future, but, you know, there is this whole, uh, well, I guess, relatively new field of what we call geriatric care managers. I'm sure Hawaii has some, typically social workers or nurses who you can pay an hourly rate to who will come in and assess your situation and help you figure out resources. And they can be, again, a good person to help you make a care plan for the future if you need that. So now I want to turn the final part of the talk to the assisted living, you know, industry and communities and talk about even what the plaza offers as well as just the broad discussion of assisted living and, and memory care. And then something that probably doesn't get talked about enough, but you know, what is the difference between independent living and assisted living and memory care? Someone might say, you know, David, I know my mom does need uh, some assisted living but why does she need memory care? Under what circumstances? So I, I'll give you my view on this, and then again, we'll have some uh, discussion from uh, you, I'm sure, with the Q&A, or even some comments from the team at the Plaza Assisted Living, or maybe someone else on the call is from another assisted living organization. So with assisted living and memory care, I think the biggest advantage right now is probably the most obvious one is there's now a team, and, and I guess you could almost argue that dementia care kind of takes a village, it takes a village, but we have kind of a deep bench of people who, who now can you know, be part of a whole team caring for your family member. Uh, they're well-trained in dementia care. And, and I do encourage you, if you're looking at an assisted living company these days, ask the marketing director, how do you train your staff? You know, what is your training program all about? Because sadly, at least here on the mainland, um, I find that the training programs are often very limited, not very, not very good. And, and it's important as a consumer to ask the company, hey, how do you train your staff? Tell me more about it. Uh, and I think that's, again, a great question in terms of quality control. Um, what else is, is helpful about residential care for elders in general? Well, of course, the health care management. And this is particularly vital in keeping people active. You know, I, I know there's a lot of guilt that comes into play. But you see, as a family member, you can only do so much, but in residential care, they can do a lot more with diabetes checks and diet. We know, for example, that um, untreated uh, high blood sugar, you know, untreated diabetes, or people who just can't seem to manage their blood sugar levels, that can be an enemy of the brain. It, it can cause cognitive loss. And uh, one friend of mine whose mother moved into this beautiful, posh retirement community in Virginia, uh, she probably had early Alzheimer's. I don't think it had actually been diagnosed yet, but she was uh, going to the buffet and eating every cake and cookie and bagel and gaining weight. Her blood sugar was going crazy and her cognition kind of just crashed. But when they got her from independent living to assisted living, they were able to therefore at that particular building get her on diabetes control, on, on some insulin, manage her diet. And would you believe they, they were so fearful that she might, you know, in their point of view, have need memory care right away well, in fact, her memory got a bit better. She actually did better because the diet was under control, the, the insulin was under control, and she was able to be, I think, in assisted living another year before she did finally go to memory care with her advancing Alzheimer's. And of course, the third bullet, and, and you know, I think this is powerful, but staff can kind of do the heavy lifting. They can hopefully get the showers done, change the briefs, and you know, get some of this stuff done. So if your mom or dad or brother, sister, whoever it is, if, they, if he or she is in memory care assisted living, uh, what I think is so great now is that you can come and have more of a social experience. You can, you can go out for ice cream or sit on the patio and enjoy life together instead of having this constant battle. So again, I think we've covered this pretty well, but I, I just want to stress enough that you know, as you're looking at assisted living buildings or communities, you want to look at the activity program. Is it, is it interesting and innovative? Because we, we, we really don't have a pill for Alzheimer's today. You know, we have four medicines, Aricept, Exelon, Razodyne, Namenda. None of those are what we call a disease-modifying medication. They kind of boost performance a little bit. They boost cognition. Some people, probably after 12 to 18 months, these dementia meds have probably done everything they can do. 
Um, so the treatment for Alzheimer's, because also, you've heard me say this, if any of you were on my very first seminar, it's now been 17 years since we've had a new FDA approved drug for Alzheimer's disease. We've, we've struggled. So the medicines are really not there for us quite yet. But you know what is there for us? Engagement, relationship. Uh, your family member, when they move into a good assisted living building or go to an excellent day program, what happens is it puts them in a therapeutic environment, an environment that is healing. And so you want to choose a place that has a good activity program, bottom line, because boredom is the enemy and socialization is so powerful. So the social milieu or social environment has friends, people have neighbors, it evokes those old social skills and manners. It, it, it fascinates me having started my career in the adult day business in a nonprofit in Lexington, Kentucky back in the 80s, that you know, even then people would come to our day center and they would do things for us. They would participate for things for us that they wouldn't do for their families. And we were very puzzled by this at first. But then I realized that, you know, for many people living with dementia, when they're when they're in a social setting with other people, it kind of evokes those old social graces. And you want to be polite, you want to be neighborly, you want to participate. And so again, it's it's incredible how sometimes people with dementia will do things in this group setting, for example, at the plaza. And you you might be surprised. Uh, I've had I have family members say, "Oh, David, mom will never do this. Mom will never do that. Mom doesn't have any any, any interest in this." And guess what? She does. So you know, again, it can be kind of fun when when you're in this new setting. And so again new experience, new friends. This is a very contemporary view of dementia. Uh, I'm very proud of my friends at the plaza because they really embrace uh, this contemporary vision that you know, when you have dementia, it doesn't mean your life is over. When you have dementia, you still wanna expose people to novelty and new ideas and learning and music and exercise. And you wanna lift them up with, with relationship-centered care and good activities to, to really bring out the best in them as, as best you can. So when you look at the plaza as one example, because I know that many of you are connected with the plaza, many of you may not be, but uh, the plaza activity program, or pardon me, the plaza dementia care program that I helped uh, consult with from the very beginnings is called Halia. And Halia, uh, I love the Hawaiian translation for that. It's basically celebrating cherished memories. And I, I, that's just a very charming and beautiful sentiment. And, and you know, you, you may wonder about that because, gosh, I thought memories diminish with dementia. And that is true. They do diminish with dementia, but not all of them, particularly early on. So we want to know what particularly is valuable and meaningful to your family member, whether, you know, it's, it's their time uh, learning to surf in Hawaii or maybe military service or perhaps winning the Teacher of the Year Award in Honolulu or you know, being Miss Hawaii or something like that. So we want to not only celebrate past memories, but this is the part that really touches me about the Plaza program, is that it's also about creating new memories. And maybe that memory might be for 10 minutes or an hour, but, but by giving people activity and engagement, it can be very powerful. So here on the left are just a few elements that I know Halia practices and that hopefully all good memory care programs on the island are practicing. But you want to surround somebody with music, with art, conversation, good food, trivia and learning, exercise, time spent out of doors, and of course, knowing a family member or probably knowing a resident's uh, social history, you want to have staff who can really cue them about their past and bring up favorite things. If, if we know your, your mom loves hot sauce, I want to make sure that the staff know to offer that you know, to her with her, her fish during dinner so we can, again, meet their personal preferences and needs. I'll comment on just a couple of these because we've already done a class on activities. But you know, I, I wanted to stress that music, here we have a ukulele. I used to say ukulele before I spent time in Hawaii, but an ukulele. And um, I will say that music is, is incredible because it turns out that song lyrics and music actually live in a different part of the brain than words and language. And I'm sure you've all noticed that your family member, uh, it's, it's incredible how they may have very poor language skills or losing words, sort of talk soup, but they still know all the old songs. Again, fascinating from neurology, but I recommend music very highly if you're doing personal care, if you're supporting people in any way, music can be great. The arts, um, 
We know that things like collage are particularly effective because it's very tactile and early stage people can do a lot more with it late. They can still press conversation, giving lots of compliments, asking opinions, reminiscing about the old memories are great. Uh, good food, <laughs> I think everybody has interest in food and that's always powerful. And trivia and learning, teach some classes, uh, do some opposites, some word games. My, my mother-in-law right now actually lives in memory care in Sacramento. And like many families, it's incredible how I've been touched by this personally as well as professionally. But basically, um, she's terrific at these word games, you know, up and down, salt and pepper, you know, animal sayings. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. It's raining cats and dogs. And, and she just gets like 100% on all the trivia tests. And I think it's fun for her. We've even also asked her about recipes from her past, and she, she does a pretty good job remembering all the steps for making a, a good brisket or meatloaf or her lasagna, her vegetable lasagna, all of that is great. Uh, again, exercise, I recommend it twice a day in whatever setting you're in because exercise is good for the brain, good for the body. And one tip I like to give family members, whether your family member is still at home or in residential care, but if you feel there's some mobility issues, um, ask your doctor to make a referral, referral for physical therapy. Because even though we know that you know, often they won't do it for more than a few sessions, Medicare will cover it. And typically you can you know, usually squeeze in at least two or three sessions and hopefully more if the person's making a bit of progress. But the PT can often work with you to explain some of the body mechanics and lifting and and give you ideas about how to get someone walking and maintaining mobility. So a physical therapist, occupational therapist, give it a shot. Um, the worst of what happens is you only have a few sessions, but usually the docs are pretty good about making that referral. And of course, Hawaii, oh my goodness, I, I miss being there. Um, but the, the weather, you know, spend a lot of time outdoors. It's sensory, it's spiritual, it's life affirming. Uh, you get natural vitamin D, and this can be very, very pleasant for you and your family member both. So let me just um, now kind of begin to talk about why this level of memory care versus independent or assisted living. Um, now, of course, in, in the mainland and probably in Hawaii, there might be buildings that are all memory care or some that are all assisted living and memory care like the plaza, as well as independent living, where in theory, it's almost like the, even though it's a senior community, it's almost like the building is really just for like an apartment, they have no services. Um, by the way, independent living is full of people with dementia, which worries me because many of them shouldn't be at that level of care, but that might be, might be a different uh, lecture. So why are we looking at memory care specifically? Well, memory cares do have some distinctive features over assisted living. So first and foremost, I'm sure you've all thought about this, is that they are designed with safety systems to reduce the risk of unsafe exit seeking. Now, very typically, they'll have a what we call a, a delayed egress door. So, you know, we're not allowed to lock people up. This is not like some 1960s psych wards. We, we don't lock people up. We have secure units that are designed with technology, to hopefully discourage and designed with the environment too, to discourage, it, you know, moving uh, unsafe exit seeking. But someone is not a hostage. They can still get out. So there are usually these doors where if you push them, they won't open for you know one or two minutes or 30 seconds, uh, and that can be terrific. You know, uh, candidly, there's there's no building in, in, in the world that I'm aware of that's 100% um, you know safe for people that you know someone can get away from anybody. But uh, the good the good neighborhoods I think have really reduced the rate of exit seeking terrifically. But this is one reason why someone goes to memory care. If your mother or father, for example, is independent senior living or assisted living, particularly. You know, the building has enormous liability risk, not to mention ethical risk. If, if your mother is wandering out at midnight to go to Walmart or, you know, leaving at three in the morning or, or getting lost, uh, it, it's very, very scary for her to stay at that level of care. They, they really ethically and even legally in most cases have to move them to a more secure environment. What are some of the other factors that distinguish memory care from assisted living per se or independent living? Well, specialized staff training, and I'm happy to do a lot of training whenever I come to the islands for the Plaza Assisted Living. But staff hopefully have had uh, a lot of in-services and hours about memory care, and even some little mini topics and in-services about how we create this therapeutic environment. I'll give you one example. I just did some staff training uh, recently virtually, 
and just reminding the staff not to argue, not to correct, to, to you know, practice patience, to do a lot of cueing, and to show their hearts and show affection as, as one way of making a good connection with the people living with dementia. Um, what are some other interesting things about memory care versus independent or assisted living? Well, you know, if your mother lives in a classic assisted living setting or independent living, uh, you know, the staff will cue her and invite her to different things. There'll be a, there'll be a, you know, today's activity flyer in the elevator. But if someone is beginning to have memory problems, if they're living in assisted living, you know, one symptom of dementia is, is withdrawal from social activity. So with traditional residential care, you know, we, we can provide a few cues and maybe knock on a few doors, but it's really up to them by and large to get to the activity. It's their choice. Uh, we, we don't, you know, provide that typical assistance. But when someone lives in memory care, you see the staff there know that if they don't go and encourage people to participate, if they don't knock on the doors or even say, Lucy, take my hand, I know you love uh, the visiting pet therapy, the dogs, please come, uh, let's go. Um, staff do that encouragement. They, they try three times to turn a no into a yes, that they, they work hard to get the people involved. And of course, the other thing about memory care, very classically, is number four, the idea that activities really are more about the journey than the destination. Uh, I was going through some old notes recently and I found kind of a funny um, set of notes I'd taken because uh, as a consultant, I've worked with a number of organizations and I had an organization I worked with in Seattle and they called me once and said they were so excited because they just hired a brand new activity director for one of their buildings that they'd struggled to find the right person. They said, oh, David, he's 28. He's very dynamic. He's good looking. The, the, the residents will love him. And, and wow, he worked on a cruise ship for three years doing activities. And you know, many of the people on the cruise ship were elders. So he's like the perfect candidate. So I met him and he was really a, a sweetheart of a guy, really enthusiastic in so many ways, perfect. But you see, he had one problem or one issue, which is that you know, on a cruise ship, an activity has a beginning, middle and end. You don't, in the middle of bingo, God forbid, say now, hey, what's your favorite color? And let's talk about this, or maybe have a little side conversation. But you see in dementia care, uh, it's more in the moment. So perhaps you're um, putting together wooden bird houses and painting them. Well, if you wanna start talking about favorite colors, you start talking about favorite colors. If you uh, decide to talk about birds and favorite birds, uh, you start doing that. You can maybe come back to the purpose of the activity. You don't have to uh, finish the activity. Uh, it's all about the journey. So again, the activities have a different flavor in memory care than they classically do in independent or assisted living. So I just thought I'd share a story about Joyce, who I know very well. And uh, a little note about her from one of the family members. When my mom lived in her independent living apartment, she was happy. But as her memory began to fail, she struggled to communicate with other residents and had trouble ordering off the menu. Now in memory care, she seems happier and less stressed. The staff is there to help her. She seems more at peace in the smaller, well-lit and comfortable environment. She's a retired nurse, and I like the fact that they call her Nurse Joyce. That perks her up a little bit. I was so afraid she wouldn't be happy, but now I don't have the constant struggles with her anymore about taking a shower or changing. We are having a lot more fun as mother and son. So it gives you, again, a flavor of what to look for. And, and I know that guilt remains very strong. You know, nobody feels good about moving their mother into assisted living. But in this case, uh, the son has said, you know, I, I think my mother is happy. And, and I like the fact that she has this socialization and friendships. I like the fact that things are going better. Now, making the move, you know, I know it's very challenging for people. Um, there's no single answer. Uh, everyone's a bit different. I have had, and this may shock some of you, I have, I have met people themselves with early Alzheimer's disease who start driving around. They're still driving, maybe not so good, but I've met a couple of people with Alzheimer's who themselves have looked at memory care neighborhoods so they can pick a place for themselves when the time comes. Again, pretty unusual. But in most cases, it's a bit of a battle, a bit of a struggle. There's no single answer. I like to start with the truth and, and share your concerns. Hey, mom, you know, the, the bathtubs, you know, caused a little mini flood a few times. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're not eating well and, you know, I worry about you falling. Um, 
we think we need to look at some options and the doctor and the family really want you to be in a better place. Uh, and so that can be, again, a discussion you have, and it may not work for everybody. Maybe you bring it up once this month and you bring it up another month, but I think it's still okay to be ethical and honest in that way. Um, you, don't wanna, you don't wanna give her 110 reasons why it's important. I, I think in many ways you can share the information about memory care or assisted living, but I think also make an emotional ask. Mom, you know, I'm not sleeping at night worrying about you. The family is so concerned. Uh, I think you need to do this for the family as well as yourself, and sometimes that can be helpful. And what are some other kind of plan B items? Well, you can blame somebody else. Mother, the doctor wants you to be here right now. You, you need to build your strength. And I don't know that I completely recommend this, but I just like to share what I hear. One family, their mom was living alone. They anonymously turned her into adult protective services. I, again, I'm not necessarily recommending that, but what was interesting is the adult protective services came in and they basically said it was unsafe for her to live at home. And the family said, mother, the, the state's gonna take you, they're gonna just take you if we don't do something. They, they're demanding that you either have 24 hour help at home or you make the move. Why don't we get ahead of this and, and you know, this is shocking, this is unconscionable, I can't believe they did this to you, mother, this is terrible, but guess what, you know, we can't fight the government. And again, it was a bit of an interesting, <laughs> interesting technique, again, not recommended per se, but the idea of blaming somebody else, I think is very powerful. Now, again, um, you know, I'm recognizing and knowing that some of you just may really be up against it, you, you may not know quite what to do next, and so let's say that your family member is still reasonably legally competent, you don't want them living by themselves, you want them to make a move. Well, here's, here's one suggestion I have is, you know, make a game plan. Uh, take a look at, you know, where you want your family member to move, maybe meet with them, fill out some initial paperwork, and, and have your file ready. Um, there, there will be, when someone lives by themselves, or even a married couple where both are frail, there will be that inevitable mer emergency, inevitable health crisis or, or challenge. And then you might have a narrow window to make a move into memory care. My, my own mother, Dorothy, uh, my, my dad was really pretty, you know, with it. He, he, he knew he wanted to make a move after a period of time when my mother wasn't sleeping at night. Uh, she went into the hospital with pneumonia. And she almost died, but she just came roaring back as often they do. And we moved her right from the hospital to memory care we said, mom, you need to build your strength. This is the place you need to be, kind of rehab. And guess what? After a few weeks, she just settled in very nicely. But see, we had our plan. We knew where we wanted her to be. And we went right from the hospital to memory care. And it was really very, very, uh, very successful. Um, so again, every case is a bit different. I'm always, I'm always happy to talk to families. You're welcome to email me or set up a call. But in general, if, you, if you're not sure how to do this, but you want to do this, I think talk to uh, some of the staff at the Plaza Assisted Living or the Alzheimer Association who can share some some best practices. And if I can if I can speak to your fears, having done this work for almost 30 years, you know, really from the very beginning of almost assisted living, um, I have to tell you that families are so afraid memory care won't work, but it almost always does. Again, they're afraid it won't work, but it often often does. Not always. We can't say 100% for anything. But often people do settle down and, and seem to find meaning and purpose and, and happiness uh, and at least get a, a much better quality of life in terms of physical care and medical care and you know, hygiene and personal care, even good food and, and friendship in a, in, a, in a good memory care neighborhood. So real quick, uh, tips for visiting. And because a couple of my last seminars are really focused on the COVID-19 crisis, I decided to be more hopeful this time and not talk about the current state of affairs, but really what we can think about for the future. So again, some general tips for visiting. Short visits are okay. Uh, when you come, I encourage you at one level to put on a bit of an Academy Award-winning performance. I know many people are a bit shy or you know, more quiet, but I think people with dementia do respond to emotions. So you know, give your mother a big friendly, mother, my gosh, I'm so happy to see you, and a smile and showing the emotion. If you need to, because sometimes you do, introduce yourself. Hey there, mom, it's David, your son. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy to see you. I know who you are. Well, maybe, maybe not. Bring a gift or a small treat, you know, flowers or some chocolates or her favorite milkshake that always kind of breaks the ice. 
again, spend time outside. And, and you know, in terms of visiting, because I've had families say to me, you know, David, I just sit there. My mother's not that talkative. I don't really know what to do or say. Well, bring a little project in, you know, bring in some fresh flowers and say, Mother, uh, I didn't have a chance to go to the forest. Would you help me put this arrangement together? Bring in some wrapping paper and some presents to wrap. M Mom, my, my secretary's birthday's coming up. I've, I've been so busy. W would you help me wrap present for her? And now which paper do you want next, the blue or the green and which bow and all that? Uh, a photo album to organize, a scrapbook to create. Maybe your, your niece is graduating from high school and you want to pick out a present for her. So, you know, open up the catalog or go online and, you know, have your mother pick out the, the sweater, write some birthday cards or holiday cards or notes. All of this can be very important. And, and be sure when you're visiting, um, every, every long term, Every long-term care company has what they call a social history or life story. Most, most are required to have that, in fact. But when you're there, I always think it's nice to share some stories about your family member with the staff. Remind them about your, your family member's interests, hobbies, talents, because the staff really benefit from knowing a lot about your family member living with dementia. And anything you can do to share that can always be very valuable. So thank you. I think we've gone about 50 minutes. Uh, Ray, thank you as always for being our, our wonderful host of, of these chats. And now I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I think we have about 10 minutes left and uh, hopefully I've given you some provocative uh, thoughts about this and some helpful thoughts. And I'll look forward to um, answering any questions that I can. And I think Ray and her team who may be on the call can also do the same. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was very informative. We do appreciate all of your knowledge. Um, I do have a few questions, and um, as we start asking questions, please feel free to, um, in your chat icon below, just type in your question. There's also a question and answer um, icon at the bottom of the screen. You can also use that. Um, but David, a question. Worried about mom's transitioning to memory care. She doesn't want her to feel abandoned. How do you help her integrate into a community and not feel guilty about it? Okay, um, a couple of thoughts I have. I think one is to kind of develop a family script, you know, and, and, and kind of take a more positive approach. Um, with my own mom, I would say things to her like, oh my gosh, mother, can you believe how beautiful this place is? You're, you are living in the Ritz Carlton, <laughs> you know, what did you do to deserve this? And I think sometimes, I don't think I quite said that last one, but, but, but you know, you're, you've led a wonderful life. You do deserve this. This is your time, mom. So I think they pick up your, your, your enthusiasm, your energy. I, I think to, to develop a script about, you know, mom, um, I know this is a bit tough for you, but this is a great place for you to be. It's, it's, they're gonna keep you healthy and, and this is a nice safe place and I want you to have friends and activity. So again, you know, being authentic and honest, if, if they are sad or want to go home, acknowledge that. But, but I think to say this is a good place for you. I think uh, visits, I'm, I'm a big fan of visiting, and I always like to say that it's okay to do a short visit. So you don't want to, like, disappear for a few weeks if you can help it, and, you know, do that as well. So I, I think that, along with making sure the staff know a lot about your mother, um, I think, and that, that they're, you know, enjoying her, her life story, um, hopefully your mother will not feel abandoned and feel very welcomed by her, her transition. You know, there's not really a science to it, but I, I will say that, you know, the first couple of weeks can be a bit rough. It, it always is. Transitions are hard. But again, often they, they then get to the point where they're enjoying it. I know for my own mother, it was really bittersweet for me, but, you know, she had been in the building for two or three months. And I can't remember what holiday it was. Maybe it was Easter or Thanksgiving. But my dad wanted her to come home for the meal. So we brought her home and we put out her best china and the cat was there. And my mother did really well for about two hours. But then she kind of looked at both of us, my, me and my dad and a few of her friends who'd gathered. And she, she said in her English accent, she said, darling, this has been very lovely. Thank you so much but I think it's time that I go home. And she actually sort of associated uh, the memory care building with her home. She'd kind of forgotten that this house was her home. So again, hopefully, hopefully she'll, she'll make a good transition. Okay, great. One, um, another question. Do seniors who have gone to a daycare have an advantage when transitioning to a memory care what a great question. I have to commend my Hawaii audience. You always have great questions. And I think the answer is yes. I, I feel that adult day centers are really terrific. I'm a big fan. 
And I remember a meeting years ago, um, uh, two people, a man and a woman, they both had spouses, uh, but they were, they were buddies at their day center, and the spouses moved them on the same day to the same memory care community. So I think day centers do provide um, that socialization and kind of sense of group, and, and I think they are positive for an eventual move to assisted living. Okay, another question. Um, so why can a staff member get mom to shower, but I cannot? <laughs> Well, I think part of it is training. Um, you know, staff members, CNAs have a lot of training about how to do personal care. Um, you know, I think, I think that it, it's a strange thing, but one of my friends who uh, has a teenager right now says the teenager won't do anything for them, but if a neighbor asks to mow the lawn, they mow the lawn for the neighbor. So there's something odd about the family dynamic that, you know, sometimes we are on better behavior in front of strangers than we are our own family. So I think there could be some of those old social graces kicking in. But overall, I, I think that um, that is not unusual. It's a plus. And I, I would chalk it up to training experience. And of course, the, the caregiver has a lot of confidence because they've done thousands of showers. And, 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 and I think hopefully um, the space as well in assisted living is better designed with grab bars and all of that to, to make the bathing experience more successful. Thank you, David. Um, okay, I think we're, we have a couple more um, and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Okay, so another question that came up is, um, so mom, my mom doesn't want to do anything with me, but what if she does nothing at memory care? So the concern of her not wanting to participate. Okay, so a couple of thoughts I have. You know, um, there are people who by their nature are shy or for whatever reason just don't want to participate. So, you know, we can't force them to do that. But I would absolutely, you know, talk to the staff, maybe ask for a care plan meeting, I'd be happy to even phone in on it or be supportive of that care plan and just brainstorm some ideas. You know, is there even one activity that she likes that we can maybe do more of? Um, are the staff asking her in different ways to participate? Um, so there, there can be a lot of reasons why, including depression that we worry about, but um, you know, do your best to um, encourage participation. And I would encourage staff just to do some brainstorming and care planning and just sort of you know, see what we think is working. I did see a quick question that popped up. I think I can answer quickly. Uh, Ray, someone asked, I guess there are family members at the plaza, is it okay to take her on outings? I think the answer is absolutely yes. You know, use some common sense. I wouldn't take her to the big shopping mall on a Saturday afternoon with a thousand people, but you know, take her to a drive-in and have a milkshake or take her for a drive. And, and you know, we wanna live life even when someone has dementia. Now, if you take her for an outing and it's a big fiasco and she doesn't wanna go home and back to the, the plaza and you really have struggles, then maybe you don't do it again, but give it a shot. Okay, we just got one, uh, another one. Um, we moved mom in February to a senior living community and has not adjusted well. She keeps asking to come home and visit. How should we, we respond? Okay, well, uh, and I'm sorry, Ray, when did they move in? February. February, March of okay, June. Okay, well, um, okay, a couple of things. I, I guess I would reiterate that, you know, honesty is good. So, I mean, within reason, you don't want to give her every single detail, but you, you, can, you can empathize. Mother, I'm really sorry. I know you want to go home. I, I know that's your preference. I, I understand but this is really the best place for you now, and this is why. You know, the doctor feels you need to be here. This is what is up. So I think if, if you can give that authentic explanation, that can be supportive. Um, the other thing too, because there are people who say, I want to go home, I want to go home, I want to go home. You take them home, an hour later they say, I want to go home. Again, language, memory. She may be talking about her childhood. It might be kind of a cry out for her past. So I love to say, tell me more about your home. You know. Remind me, mother, do you live in the city or the country? Or, you know, wh what, uh, what did you like best about being at home? Uh, what were your favorite recipes? Um, you know, uh, why did you pick that house? And sometimes when you get them, believe it or not, to talk more about it, it actually kind of can touch their spirit and, and help them feel better and somehow redirect them from that. So there's not any one answer, but, um, you know, be authentic when you can. 
Uh, I mean, families do what it takes, and sometimes the first month or two, they say, Mom, we're, we're repairing the house. It's, you know, got flooded, and I'm not a big fan of these, you know, really over-the-top uh, fibs, but sometimes you have to almost do things like that because it is in the person's best interest for them to be in a safe place. Thank you, David. Well, we're just coming up on um, three o'clock. So I want to thank you uh, for providing such wonderful knowledge and information on um, information about assisted living and memory care. I also want to um, thank everyone for attending. And just as a reminder, on September 21st, we're going to be having our annual Halia Memory Care Conference. And it will be virtually. So I um, will let you folks know and, and our Plaza staff will be sending out um, a flyer with information to register. Um, so please be on the lookout for that. We're really excited. We're gonna have some really key speakers um, and it's gonna be a about a five hour presentation about um, with about three to four speakers. So we're really looking forward to that. Thank you, Ray. I can't reiterate enough that this conference, it'll be a virtual conference September 21, which happens to be World Alzheimer's Day has a tremendous faculty of, of experts, including one of the top geriatric psychiatrists in the country, talking about her work and about medicines and psychiatric issues. So please do come and join us for that conference. Uh, I will say also, Ray's been super about recording all the questions we didn't get to. And uh, when I get the questions that we didn't get to from Ray over the next uh, day or so, we will be responding uh, via email. Um, my, my email is very simply davidtroxel at gmail.com, uh, one L. You're always welcome to email me and I, I'll do my best to answer your questions. Again, uh, my, my wonderful friends at Plaza, thank you for your, your long friendship and thanks for providing this great forum. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye.